Okay, so today we unpack non-human kinship, how we understand loneliness and non-human animals, about animals, and this consideration for the future of non-human relationships. So I'm thrilled and thankful to welcome these incredible um, people, uh, Barbara J. King, Emerita Professor of Anthropology at William & Mary, and now a science writer, Kite, aka Suzanne Kite, Oglala Lakota performance artist, visual artist, and composer, and PhD candidate at Concordia University. Juno Salazar Perenez, assistant professor in the Department of Science and Technology Studies at Cornell University. And Sonia Zhang, PhD student at New School, uh, currently based in China. Uh, so I welcome you all. And let's just start with a brief self introduction, uh, just two to three minutes of how this topic touches your work. And Barbara, your work has focused on non-human animals um, and how they express emotions like grief and friendship. So how would you say loneliness uh, touches your work? Thank you, Nicole. And before I start, I would just like to thank everyone at the center who's been involved in organizing this panel and thank also my fabulous co-panelists today. Yes, I'm a biological anthropologist, and my current work has been focused heavily on understanding emotions as expressed by other than human animals. So about 12 years ago, I had been finishing up a project on burial rituals in Neanderthals and animals. And I started exploring this, and it just kind of exploded, by which I mean I found all kinds of evidence for grief and mourning in a variety of animals. And this includes not just chimpanzees, elephants, orcas, but giraffes and peccaries, dogs, cats, rabbits, it goes on. So from there, I wanted to develop a definition of animal grief that was very clear and conservative. This was before this whole explosion of this wave of animal grief studies. So I wanted to be on very short ground. And I talked about how an animal survivor, when someone dies and there's a survivor, might act in a very different way than normal. She or he might socially withdraw, eat or sleep or travel differently, show species specific bodily face and voice evidence of, of sadness. And here is where loneliness comes in because what I found is that often individual survivors acted in a way that seemed to show they were really pining for an individual other. And I think that too is loneliness. You know, you may be surrounded by other individuals but you're lonely for a particular animal, particular person. So I found out about uh, ducks in New York who'd been fast friends, one died, the other would go to a particular pond where the two of them had been and just not want to interact with anyone else. Or two house cat sisters in Virginia and one died and the other wailed and searched. And so loneliness really is threaded through my work on animal emotion. And sometimes it seems that an animal can recover from that experience and sometimes not. So I've been exploring all of these issues. And I could add just briefly that this work has been a springboard into understanding how our grasp of animal emotions can sort of motivate us ethically. So I've been working on behalf of animals who are held in medical research laboratories. And I think loneliness comes into play there. These individuals, they are often monkeys in, in my work, um, many thousands of monkeys just in this country are held in cages alone for many years, you know, a so kind of solitary situation. And I think from their behavior that they may be very lonely. So there's a number of other projects I'm working on, but that's a good start. Okay, there's a think... question in the chat about my repeating the last sentence. Of course, I don't know because I didn't have an outline in my head, but I was talking about our evolved tendencies to grieve in community around those who are dying and dead and how the pandemic has not allowed us to do that. So that has, of course, engendered a certain type of loneliness as well. 
And I, I think what's interesting, Barbara, is the, the focus that you have on death and loss and grief, and it does connect with others who are here at this round table today. Um, Juno, in particular, you've talked about loss and grief in the context of the extinction and how we might embrace these very specific ideas to better address um, animal welfare issues uh, when you've looked at orangutan rehabilitation centers, um, especially in these unexpected violent interactions built in conservation efforts. So how, how do you see loneliness coming in your work? Is it in this uh, similar vein or how might we expand on it thinking about your uh, topic? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks so much for hosting this conversation. I have really fond memories of C21 when I went there in person for a conference on after extinction a few years ago. And it uh, created a space to bond and make friends with people whose work I read. Um, it got to meet in person. So I I hope this can also function in the same way, having long been a fan of Barbara King's work and to get to meet you all here too. Um, you know, I had a chance to actually workshop a chapter of my um, book, Decolonizing Extinction, the Work of Care at uh, C21 in the context of a conversation, like a panel, a small like 15 minute panel paper, um, but still it was very fruitful. So the the book uh, that I worked on was based on ethnographic field research at uh, an orangutan rehabilitation center. And um, what I found there is that, okay, orangutans in general are thought to be the least social of all great apes. So it's different um, from saying that they're not social, they are social. And yet the way they are social isn't like recognizable by you and me, like our standards as, as people most likely. So like their bonds are like with a mother infant dyad that lasts for about seven years, um, you know, like moments of courtship, you know, that are fleeting. Um, but it's a really different kind of social life than the social lives that people take for granted. And what happens at the rehabilitation center is that instead of living in a large forest where an orangutan has a choice of who to interact with, how frequently, and so on. They're forced to live in packed circumstances that feels like a city. So for instance, instead of having a range of seven square kilometers, a female orangutan will be forced to share space with 30 other orangutans in the same space. And so what's happening is that loneliness is an aspiration that never gets to actually be fulfilled. Um, it's, and I know it's an aspiration because you see that in the behavior of like certain specific orangutans who like will refuse going to the feeding center for weeks on end. So that orangutan is preferring hunger over social encounters, you know? So um, I can kind of relate to this desire for loneliness and the inability to actually have that loneliness enacted, you know, partially because of like my own uh, biographical circumstances. I am um, a child of like, in a family with eight children. <laughs> you know, and I really wanted my own space and I didn't have it, you know? Um, and like, likewise, like I was one of the few people who was quite happy in the immediate aftermath of the pandemic where it gave me reason to just completely shut down and not speak to anybody for weeks on end. <laughs> so I, I know I'm an outlier in this. Um, However, I do think that we need to remember that what we think of as loneliness is um, profoundly specific. Yeah, and I, I think that we can have a conversation about how specific it is to humans and a human condition, how it can manifest in other than human relationships, and how those relationships also inform how we're defining it in the first place. Um, which I find really interesting in your in your answer, Juno, being alone and being lonely are are different things that we're trying to. Um, disentangle and there is something uh, interesting there about needing these spaces to be alone or connecting in different ways which is um partially a segue into into suzanne's work um your work in particular it um emphasizes a decolonial framework which juno is also using in her work to kind of think through um a, a orangutan rehabilitation and conservation um and and 
might be used in understanding of non-human relations. So, but it's not just animals that's being considered. Um, you're considering um, AI and you're considering machine design. You've written much about how Lakota ontology and epistemology may help us create uh, healthier, more equitable relationships. So um, Suzanne, how do you see loneliness coming out in your work and how it's coming out in your artwork as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess in my my artwork, um, most of my work, uh, while being an artist and academic, I'm mostly thinking about less about critical. I, I don't really consider my work that, that decolonial. Maybe it's anti-colonial, but I'm trying to make generative thoughts from Lakota ontology and start from there instead of starting elsewhere. Um, and kind of trying to decide how if we're going to choose what kind of being stated status of beinghood we work with um deciding to use like local hyper local ontologies um so that's kind of where my where my relationship with uh, non-humans begins so i think when looking at this um subject matter i was thinking a lot about um all of the things i know about how some hu non-humans don't want to know humans um, don't necessarily want to know each other, you know, there's um, that agency refusal and agency and all those things um, extending those questions to uh, to non humans such as stones. Um, and uh, let me share my screen and I'll hopefully this doesn't crash. Cool. Um, so some of so this is some of the artworks. These are interactive machine learning artworks, which aren't very, they're not good, not they're not good non humans yet they, they can't um, agree to be part of the artwork. Uh, we don't know if they're alive. Um, because in Lakota ontology, only some, uh, only some stones have agency. Um, and it's a complex and individual relationship to find out which. Um, so a lot of my work has to do with this, this is a piece um, telling rock with um, Devin Ronneberg. Um, some other works that I've done specifically about loneliness are um, this piece, uh, Better Off Alone, um, which is uh, about rave memorabilia, and there's an online chat room that you can, because um, uh, I have a lot of, most of my experience of um, working with like um, loneliness in terms of computer art is uh, is through chat rooms, so I do a lot of this kind of chat room based stuff. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, the, I do one thing that I wanted to bring up in terms of this concept of loneliness was the work I do with Alicia Worm, uh, B. Wormsley, who who um, is an Afrofuturist, and kind of in the pandemic we started doing these workshops for Black and Indigenous artists to um, take naps together. Basically, we invited Trisha Hersey to help guide us and and that kind of thing. Um, some of the other things that I um, I've been writing about um, relationships with non-humans such as aliens. Um, which is recently in the American Indian Journal of Research. Uh, let's see. Um, really love ma making chat room uh, based computer art. So, but I just want to, I guess, end with my most recent. Uh, this is the work I'm working on for my uh, PhD dissertation, um, specifically about like relationships with non humans um, coming out of uh, Lakota material practice. So when we, the impulse to make something to be a to be a creative agent um it's a decision that is not taken lightly and has to be considered the not all non-humans in the physical realm and all non-humans in the non-physical realm which is why stones are so interesting because they're they're really at this this in-between state they're like nodes of time and space collapsing and when we meet them it's kind of like stars and so when we when i'm thinking about listening to non-humans um and learning from them how i want to create new things what how do non-humans do epistemology so i guess in terms of loneliness the uh, the last thing i wanted to say um is you know coming from in the united states and uh uh the, st the status of like lonely people and lonely non-humans i think is like un unimaginable um post industrial revolution and post enlightenment and post um, you know, environmental collapse. Um, there's a lot of lonely beings out there who are, you know, and if we're talking about humans, um, you know, there's a really bad suicide rate in Pine Ridge Reservation, like 150% higher than the national average. Um, and, you know, when you have 89% unemployment people and like 
you know, median income is like 9,000 or no, per capita is like 8,000 a year. So you're going to have extreme loneliness because of the extreme level of, of, um, of depression. And, and I, and I find that um, most of my, a lot of my work has turned towards um, Native American church um, practitioners and, and people who use song as that mechanism uh, to create new knowledge, but also to create um, connections between humans and non-humans, both in the physical and the, and the non-physical realm. And that, and, and like song making and art making is, does that work? And so I think that's kind of, um, cure for loneliness is, is definitely, I'd say the answer might, in Lakota world might be song. Um, I know a bunch of people who'd probably say that song and prayer. Um, but yeah. That's kind of my approach to ethical relationships with non-humans. It's a um, it's a beautiful bridging of the roundtables that are happening with our with the with the program and your um, Suzanne you seem in conversation uh, tangentially with Chicago Azawa De Silva who was in the roundtable preceding this one speaking to. Uh, she uh, went through chat rooms, uh, suicide chat rooms, suicide pack chat rooms in Japan, and had much to say about this interlocking relationship between depression, loss, grief, and loneliness, and how it manifests in humans. But then also thinking about cures for loneliness, um, our round table in May is focused on uh, incarceration and weaponizing loneliness and um, ways that art can be perhaps this way of, of transitioning out of loneliness. And when we did that survey, a lot of people did actually cite song and music as a way to transition from a state of loneliness to connectedness. So thinking about that in the context of um, the agency of stones and having ethical relations with non-humans um, is, a, is a really great transition to end connector of these round tables, thank you. Um, Sonia, of this group, uh, your work speaks most explicitly to the topic of loneliness. You are studying it quite, um, quite diligently in your work, um, how it's defined and addressed particularly um, by social roboticists. So um, how do you think about loneliness in the context of, of non-human kinship, not just now if we're thinking about local, hyper-local ontologies, but also thinking of the future when we're looking at um, AI and design and robotics? Thank you, Nicole, and I will add my thanks to you for organizing such a wonderful roundtable. It's been really a, it's been so exciting to hear from Barbara, Juno, and Suzanne about how to, how to understand loneliness in a way that is at odds with maybe the um, all the conversations we are hearing about in the public health realm on sort of eliminating loneliness and so on. Um, I was laughing when Gino talked about her attitudes toward loneliness because when I started to encounter this whole, um, the UK's appointment of a minister for loneliness in 2018, one of the central slogans was uh, eliminating loneliness. And I was so, in my head, it was like, well, what do you mean eliminating loneliness? Um, it, it just it was just so counterintuitive and I decided to look into that um, and I thought last week we had a lot of great con sorry it's not the last week it was the last panel we had so many great conversations about how we define loneliness today and um, and how I think there was a quote from the neuroscientist of loneliness John Cassiopo who defines loneliness as this perceived social isolation and I became interested in how, what, what is the social in that sort of narrative that's been incredibly politically and socially mobilizing these days? Um, and I noticed that in lots of these public programs and leaflets about overcoming loneliness, um, the non-humans were not as present as I thought they would be. Um, for, and, and among them, I think um, for, for technological non-humans, there was not just a sense of neglect, but also almost a sense of aversion there. In, for example, in one of the um, Joe Cox Commission reports in 2017, which was an important document that amounted to the um, ministry's establishment in the UK in 2018, they, there was a line where they used the amount of time people spend with their TVs as a proxy for loneliness. Um, and well, I wouldn't completely agree or disagree with that statement, but I thought that reflect, it reflects some very, as Juno said, some very um, specific understandings on what counts as social. There is such a wide um, distrust and skepticism that we still encounter today on how there's something profoundly lonely and quote unquote inauthentic about spending time with a 
um, non-human that is, well, that is sometimes like organic, inorganic, technological, um, or, or beyond these qualif qualifications. So then I became interested in um, how social roboticists in Japan who were operating in this almost stereotypically dystopian of this like disappearing um, relationships and facing all these controversies and skepticisms about being with non-humans and trying to do something um, generative from it. Um, I'm paraphrasing Suzanne from just now. And I think in those efforts, there are, well, there are lots of um, controversial things going on, as I said, but there are also some attempts to really transfer the modality of loneliness. So not all the projects are about overcoming or eliminating loneliness and transferring them into some kind of um, in-person community event composed of people, but maybe, um, but maybe doing something else with loneliness. For example, building a robot that can express loneliness that urges people to understand them in some different ways. Um, and I'm not saying that they are sort of in opposition with all the public health programs that we have been talking about. It's just that I just thought they were they were so fascinating and I think they speak so much to the other kinds of non-humans that we are talking about here. It's, um, it's so interesting to think about how defining loneliness then goes into how we um, cultivate and make it through machines and machine learning um, and how we, we place it on, on non-human animals or organisms and looking at behaviors of, of other, other than human animals and, and making sense of what loneliness can be. So I guess, uh, Sonia, I wanna uh, just take a little bit more time with you and maybe bridge the conversation between you and, and Barbara here. Um, I see you both talking about kinship and friendship with non-humans in your work. Uh, pet robots on one hand for, for you, Sonia, and living, breathing animals on the other for, for you, Barbara. Um, so uh, some are hesitant to apply emotions like loneliness and connection to non-humans when we're making these connections with anthropomorphism often cited as a problem. So can, um, can you pr perhaps speak a little bit to this and how it looks different when looking at robots versus living, breathing animals uh, in Barbara's case. Uh, what might we say about loneliness and connection when thinking about friendship and love and connectedness between a robot pet and a, and a living, breathing pet? Thank you, Nicole. And, um, and I would love to hear about what, what Barbara what it's going to say about um, like organic non-humans, let's put it this way for now. Um, and um, regarding anthropomorphism, I like from, from what I observed, there is a wide sort of distrust against um, anthropomorphic sort of attributions to social robots, even though they are at many times deliberately designed to invoke sort of anthropomorphic um, attitudes and modes of interaction. And a lot of this concern is ethical, so it might, um, it might bring up this problem of deception where the person who are interacting with the social robot might not be aware of the um, sort of like incompleteness of sociality that is designed in the social robot and that the social robot might carry forth some stereotypical notions of humanness and the social that is that is that comes from um, you know, software developers and maybe a long-standing history of colonialism and technological determinism. Um, although, Although I, I, I really think those um, conversations are valid and have their point, but I think um, from the literature of animal studies and so on, there are lots of evidence telling us about how, you know, finding something similar, finding something familiar is such a major mode of creating relatedness that works for us, that worked for us for for, for a really long time. And there's something weird about rejecting that mode of relatedness when you are facing something that is defined as non-humans. So for me, the question was um, more about when we are thinking about anthropomorphism with technological non-humans, what is the anthropos that we are talking about? Like what, what is the um, definitions and boundaries of that? And I think with that sort of reflexivity, there is much more, there are much more opportunities than limitations to think about robot pets and maybe anthropomorphic robots in, um, I don't know, in generative terms. I'd love to hear from Barbara about this question. No, oh, thanks, Sonia. That's so interesting. And I hope we can, at the end of this little interlude, just speak directly to each other about it. 
Um, in speaking about organic non-humans, I'm going to start by saying that animals aren't voiceless. You know, you always hear these days that if you're an activist, you have to speak up for the voiceless. And that's well-intentioned, but when it comes to the animals that I study, it's actually very misleading. And I think it feeds, however unintentionally, into human exceptionalism. Because if we really observe animals, we can see something about the emotions that they express. We know that animals have you know, good days, bad days. We know that they feel this huge range of emotions from sorrow and grief to joy and any number of things. So I am trying to take that sort of framework, which is mindful of human exceptionalism and mindful of how profoundly these animals are capable of expressing themselves in species specific ways and say, let's reframe anthropomorphism because it is weaponized often, right? It's often sort of thrown out to say, Oh, look, Barbara, if you really think that that particular duck is grieving, it's a projection of what you would do or think or feel in that situation. But look, if we really are finding by comparing before and after situations with survivors of a death and really looking at species specific patterns that change, as I described in my definition of grief, then how can it be anthropomorphic? I mean, if it's anthropomorphic, like we're claiming that love and grief and sorrow and joy belong to us. And because they belong to us, that's how you get this sense that we're just projecting them onto someone else. But if we turn that on its head and we say, no, these don't belong to us. They are belonging to, constituting the lives of, co-created by any number of other animals, then the anthropomorphism conversation, I think, is, is shifted. It may not shut down, but it's, it's really shifted. And that, in turn, opens a whole space for us to talk about, you know, what does it mean to really see that these animals express all of these things? What does it mean for us? And I think it obliges us to think very hard about who we eat, who we entertain ourselves with, who we consider separate from ourselves. And in conclusion, I just wanna say that it's hard because we're trapped in human language, right? We, we don't know necessarily how to talk about the feelings that other animals have without invoking our own words for them. And I know we have to be careful about that. But it's also the case that my argument is very much not suggesting that ethical responsibilities only adhere when we can recognize emotions of other animals that are similar to ours. And here, Sonia, is where I think we connect because you're talking about this similarity that is always invoked when we look for connection. But what we have to worry about in, in my discipline, which is really animal advocacy as much as anything, is not limiting ourselves to caring about animals when we can recognize their cognition and recognize their emotion. So we have to worry about that similarity. I mean, would you agree with that, Sonia? Yeah, totally. Um, I think the sort of the sort of sense of recognition, like really, I mean, there, there are some like there are some really interesting distinctions in the in the conversations about animals and about human like social robots. And what you were saying reminds me of um of Levinas actually on how to like what constitutes an ethical relationship that sometimes it's not about sameness which can be so like so often mistakenly attributed in the case of anthropomorphism but it can also be about really um acknowledging and throwing oneself into that unknowable alterity that to 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 know that there's something that you just cannot completely understand and to some people that is an expression of loneliness as well um, and this reminds me of these developments in social robots that where some roboticists try to design robots that look that in appearance and behaviors do not look anything like humans or animals they try to invoke this sort of almost minimalist design although the concept of minimalist may be problematic, but they try to invoke imaginations that are not human-like or animal-like that invokes you to create that kind of relatedness or loneliness or solitude that just hasn't been named before. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm just seeing connections everywhere <laughs> with all of your work. Um, and, and Sonia was talking about uncertainty and ethical relationships. That's what Suzanne's been writing about <laughs> quite a bit. Um, and I didn't know if Suzanne, you wanted to respond directly to that, or I had this more specific question related to how Barbara's thinking about recognition and, and recognition versus scientific observation. Um, because we use scientific observation to understand the relationships that form between animals and in understanding our human relationships with other animals or non-human non -human kin. Um, but much of that's based in Western European colonial epistemologies, and you've written about settler reactions to uncertainty, creating problems with making meaningful kin in, um, in with, if we are wedded to settler epistemology. So I, I didn't know if you, if Suzanne, you had something to speak directly to Sonia or Barbara or um, just related to this conversation that's kind of trending. Yeah, actually, I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean, and actually, Barbara, you said something that I often say about, you know, about respect and um, like the choice, like, like somehow there's something about I, maybe it's Western epistemology where there's some sort of setup or the ontological structure that says like, oh, um, some things um, are like deserve respect and some things don't. Um, but it becomes very clear when you look at like the, the resistance to let's say like the um, like preserving, like giving rivers human rights, giving animals human rights. When, when you reach that, I always come up to that concept and say, well, it's clear that in the in Western um, epistemo like ontology, you can choose which humans are humans. So how, of course, it's a choice. And if you decide, oh, rocks aren't don't have agency, you can choose. As soon as you can say one thing um, is out, e even though it's unknowable on many levels. If I can choose one thing that doesn't deserve respect, then you can choose anybody, anything, anywhere doesn't reserve, deserve respect. And I and I think that's kind of at the root of some of some of my I mean even my interest in AI like I don't even care about AI most of the time it's just a really great window to to look into um the ontological choice um and versus uh, uh understanding um through experience and one of the things that I've I was re thinking about recently in terms of this um of uncertainty, which actually I think more I'm interested in this idea of unknowability and the different ways that um, uh, we're set up to uh, need to know and need science scientific facts to prove that things deserve respect is, is a similar pathway to me through epistemologies to say that, um, you know, that we don't deserve yet yeah, that, that animals or non humans or even humans um, don't don't deserve beinghood. So, and one thing I've been thinking about very recently, especially in this this paper about about, about aliens, more or less about star people, is um, is that there's a very intense desire for indigeneity in Western society. Like there there's a desire for relationships with the land and and the animals and stars, and and there is an extreme loneliness there. And, and I'm in the middle of working on this project, but I, I have the suspicion that um, there's some really dark uh hunting relationships in like in the americas um and i feel like in that um you're looking at how hunter how america like white settler american hunters like um want to have this like this spiritual relationship with the land but it ends up being this like really horrific sexual violence sort of relationship with animals um uh, so that's been a real um a real place of i'm, I'm trying to think through right now and, and I think in general, um, th this question of of unknowability, um, I, I, I'm a very, like, I'm going to say it over and over, but, um, you know, it, it comes down to covenants, indigenous relationships to um, plants and animals and people. They're covenants that are set up um, in really specific places. So everywhere, especially if we're talking about the United States every, and Canada, everywhere you go, there's a really hyper-local ontological um, uh, covenants that are already and I like this co word covenants a lot because I think sometimes um, we get in these weird like confusing conversations about if well if you love if native people love animals so much why do they kill them and eat them uh, but it's much more complicated that and it has to do with um, uh, affording the millennia of covenants with those animals and and the caretaking of that of that place both spiritually and and physically 
um, let's see. I think that, yeah, that's it. There's a lot to, to, to build on, um, especially thinking of a knowability and there's something that's connecting your and Bar your work and Barbara's work as well in thinking about loneliness and distance, that distance being actual physical distance from others, but loneliness also being evoked through the unknowable distance, the distance of language, for instance, and having that uh, impede on connection where you need to re with hyper local ideas of connectedness and covenants. I think there's something there that we can talk to about how connection can be re, reapproached and and reframed. Um, Juno, it, it, also thinking about violence uh, and how and what Suzanne was just talking about. Um, you your your work has addressed uncertainty about non-human longevity and maybe even human longevity. And how, how does this also relate to loneliness, kind of continuing this conversation? And how might um, these types of frameworks, the hyper, hyper local framework that Suzanne's providing us and thinking, making and covenants, having us think about, um, how might it, that help us think through loneliness and even extinction uh, differently? Yeah, I liked what Suzanne uh, was saying earlier about like the the lonely hunger, the hungry loneliness of uh, settler hunters, right? And I think about how many apply like duck urine not, or like buck urine on themselves to smell differently. And they take the signs of wanting to show that they're part of the place to be able to better exploit the place and to incorporate and ingest, uh, consume the place. Um, I don't work in settler colonial context in North America. I work in Southeast Asia. And um, yeah, this line of thinking reminds me of this conversation I had with my neighbor in the longhouse. So the longhouse, it's a setup where um, it's the Iban longhouse. So it's like different families, each family's behind a single door and there's a common hallway. And in that common hallway, uh, social life lives. And so her cousin was married to a French guy. And so she spent some time in France and she remembers it being extremely weird for her because she was saying to me, you know, in the Rawai, nobody's there. <laughs> like, like the space, the space of the apartment building, which physically looks like a longhouse is not one because it is so isolated. And that there's something about well, specifically French society, but you could say that at large Western society facilitates this deep isolated loneliness, um, especially from the perspective of an Iban person who's visiting France. Um, so again, it kind of underscores the point for me that we have to think of loneliness as very specific, like culturally, historically, and so on. Um, so when it comes to extinction and the way extinction is narratized or um, written about, narrated. Um, often, like I think about like Martha, the passenger pigeon, who was the last of her kind in 1910, she dies in Cincinnati Zoo. And the way the loneliness is talked about is around the yearning of a partner, you know, that she is the last of her kind and she doesn't have a partner <laughs> and she does not get to reproduce and make more passenger pigeons because extinction at the end of the day is about um, the viability of a population getting to reproduce. And so part of the critique for me is that I see the way heterosexism uh, trickles and like frames these discussions around extinction and this assumption that um, any kind of um, biological life is fulfilled by reproduction, you know, and that's, that's not true, <laughs> you know, because, you know, because there's more to life than being able to be able to reproduce, you know, that there's so many kinds of other kinds of social um, bonds to make and to facilitate and to have and you know, they have different kinds of durations, like whether that's like a lifetime social bond or a season of happy memories, you know? Uh, and so it's, 
I, this is a project I'm working on right now about animal retirement. And I, it's about, um, it's called short stories, long lives, properties of animal retirement. And uh, one of the things that I'm working through is the way in which animal advocacy has issues of race and racism that underlie it, but that are difficult to talk around. And so I'm, I don't really have the words for this because I'm still thinking through this. So, you know, this question of um, isolation for me, I, I, I often think about solitary confinement and the extreme cruelty of it. And I'm so glad you're having a workshop dedicated to thinking of human incarceration. And there's, there's literature now in animal studies that talks about um, animals as incarcerated. And I feel like there's a profound discomfort I have with it. And part of me, I totally hear you, Barbara, when you're talking about anthropomorphism being weaponized as a way to say and dismiss actual grief that you can empirically study. Um, and so yet I draw a line somewhere when we're talking about, you know, the, um, the extreme cruelty of an animal that should be social, that wants to be social. And to talk about that as like solitary confinement, it feels like the, um, like I, I worry um, at the ways in which our, um, our desire to make the problem of confinement as a, a really profound, powerful one rests too much on, um, on uh, dehumanization, you know? And like, I haven't, I don't have any like solid um, frameworks to really help me with this, you know? Um, but it's the concern I have of how can we talk about forms of injustice, recognizing the specificity of each kind of life, you know, without diminishing the violence it's done to specific groups of people or animals. I think that this is <clears throat> speaking to a challenge of of studying loneliness as well. So there, there, we're 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 all studying very different aspects of non-human kinship, of ethics around that. This language that we're trying to build around loneliness and how we're trying to build a language that we're trying to build around what it means to have a relationship with other than humans around us. And we're actually getting a lot of questions in the chat too, and I wanna be mindful of those questions, but there does seem to be like this issue of scale and, and how policy making happens today is on a generalizable large scale, a planetary scale, the scale of a nation and how that's being bounded with geopolitical boundaries and trying to apply everyone that's in that boundary to a, a, a code of conduct is really, we're, we're having trouble here, like having like a language, a joint language to talk about this. So there's a few um, really great questions in the chat here that I wanna make sure that we get to. We have about 40 minutes left. I do wanna to get to this question that actually Barbara uh, posed in our, um, in our like pre-meeting about, um, ecological grief and thinking about a planetary crisis and how um, that creates like new opportunities for us to try and build this language of connection, but also understand the bit better loneliness. And Juno talking about how extinction and the loneliness set to that is uh, predicated on heteronormative sexism <laughs> on rep and reproduction. It just, it's, um, it's so important to point to that because I think like that's such a, a an important space of when we're thinking about our planet in crisis right now is we're worried about reproduction in the future, productivity in the future. And um, there has been some conversation about loneliness being connected to this yearning of this constant production and growth. So I wonder if anyone here has been thinking about that or wants to like try to tackle that question or um, want to elaborate on anything anyone has said so far about this shared language of connection and loneliness that we're trying to get at here. I might say something in conversation with Juno because I think Juno, what you're saying is incredibly important about not wanting our desire for connection to override the need for specificity. 
And that's something I'm struggling with. So I certainly don't have it worked out. I am interested in thinking about principles of social justice that are applied in a multi-species context while preserving the specificity. So, and I think I can connect this also to ecological grief, but I, well, if I go back to the example that I gave in the beginning, which may or may not have been recorded due to the glitch, in working on behalf of laboratory animals, and we're talking here in my case about monkeys, although this could also be rats and mice and any number of other animals, I think about the fact that consent has been you know, not taken into account at all. I mean, one might ask how would a laboratory animal consent, but people don't, they just do what they want to do. And autonomy of these animals is completely overridden. And I do think that this results in pain and suffering and loneliness. So what do we do with that when we try to, to you know, it, is it important to measure that against human lack of consent, autonomy and suffering? Is it important to, to think globally about how we apply these social justice principles when loneliness does seem to span species? And what I was asking in terms of ecological grief is just to, to see where this connection can actually bring us as humans some degree of, of solace. I mean, it's not that we're going to feel comfortable and happy when we know that other animals suffer and feel grief, but rather that it's another way to, to profoundly connect with the natural world that we're trying to save. And at the same time, I think it's incredibly important to realize that we're, you know, we can't invoke nostalgia and go back to the way we want the world to be in the past because that's not going to happen. So how do we use this fulcrum of connection and specificity to imagine new worlds? And I'll, I'll just leave it there. There's perhaps there's connections among these thoughts, but I am still working on them. Yeah, and I, I wonder if the the connect like the reimagining new worlds is something that Sonia that social roboticists are also thinking about. If we're like we have these tools and these technologies that we're also thinking with, and I know Suzanne, you also you like even though <laughs> AI whatever, but but it can also it can be a useful tool to think with uh, when trying to reimagine or re um, reframe how we're we're thinking about this. I really love that tension that all of you have pointed out between connectedness and specificity that um, that in, in so much of the narratives when we are talking about connectedness there, it really is talking about some kind of sameness that is very specific and then that sameness in turn imposes violence and um, and I, I don't have something coherent in my head but this conversation is, it, it reminded me a bit about what Suzanne you were talking about how People have this in North America have this hunger for for connecting with a place, with the land, with water, because there is this some kind of cosmological um, loneliness operating. And then, and then, I think maybe perhaps it's the same discussion. Perhaps it's a parallel discussion. There is this sense of existential loneliness that that we talk about when we are thinking about ourselves being alone in the cosmos or in as as a kind of being. And there are human centric um, sort of assumptions behind that, I guess. But I think. Um, what makes it relevant, what makes existential loneliness relevant in the field of social robotics actually relates to one of the questions I saw in the chat about um, the uncanny relation, like the, the uncanny valley that was that was a phrase coined by one of the um, pioneering social roboticists in Japan. In, in that case, you, you have this graph on um, um, human likeness and I guess, I guess effective investment so the basic the basic principle is that when there is something that looks very much like a human but there's something off with it like maybe the movements are jerky maybe there's something not right you feel a very um, deep sense of horror and people would assume that the way out of uncanny valley is to actually match that humanness to a complete level sort of imagining a holistic sense of the human being um, but in one of the interviews i found out that he was when he mentioned the uncanny, he mentioned it as a Buddhist concept instead of a Freudian concept. So what he's actually referring to is this is this sense of disconnection from the sense of loneliness from the world that in Zen Buddhism creates a condition for recognizing this 
um, radical inter interdependence with the rest of the world. And, um, and then it comes to alternative, alternative ontological commitments that I guess, um, Suzanne, you were talking about, and it makes me think about, you know, are there um, conceptual frameworks that can help us think about interdependency and interconnectedness without relying on principles of sameness? And, 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 and maybe to, to be able to think about that, we have to increase our scope of thinking from individuals and societies to planetary and other units where we describe our relationships with the rest of the world. Yeah, I'll respond to that. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, that's really interesting about the uncanny. Uh, and I think that that speaks to the I guess what I wanted to emphasize, which is, I, I guess I'm personally not interested in, in, in grief or like even considering what's happening in apocalypse. I think that, um, I, I'm not really interested in, um, I guess critique sometimes even, uh, because I'm, I'm so sure of the, almost infinite generative possibilities um, of solutions that that are that just exist in constant states all, all around and then and especially in like in many play I mean I'm my, my expertise is in North America but I, I know for a fact in South America and Europe and like in Africa and in my, where, no matter where you go in the world, there are very time tested processes for having healthy relationships with uh, the natural world. Um, and it is a new, it is an absolutely new concept that we, um, that we can't do it. And so I'm, I guess coming from a group of, you know, coming from a, a culture where, you know, Apocalypse has been forced upon our land, um, and you know we see the ecological collapse when you see just cattle everywhere. Um, that it, but we know very clearly that the solution there that we keep the solutions alive because at some point they will be absolutely necessary. And and I think that anybody, especially when dealing with diasporic cultures and diasporic relationships with um, you know non-human beings. Um, um, those become even stronger um, in their distance and to speak to distance because of the um, their the ability to to, to move the, move this knowledge into the present. I think one of the really I mean there's a lot of interesting stuff um, in like North American indigenous religions where um, knowledge was chosen to be for, um, forgotten, where it was chosen not to be passed down because it was too powerful for the um, for that generation, um, but that's not to say that like all things are know are all knowable things um, have the potential to be knowable, um, and and I think that is very um, makes me feel like the generative is is possible. Uh, I, I think the other thing I was thinking about um, in terms of futurism is this uh, the possibility. Um, in imagination, like and create the creation of new things um, as this epistemological place of of growth um, and infinite possibility, I think is also to me the the way I think about the future. But yeah, it's in there, I'm just like pulling out keywords: um, uh, potentiality and possibility versus grief and loss, respect and trust, and then choice also seems to be coming out. Juno, with your example of the longhouse and that choice to create a social space in that architecture, even though apartment buildings in France have very similar architecture, but you choose not to make that interlude a social space where everyone has their doors open. There's something there too that I think is kind of related to these ideas, and I and I, I hesitate with the choice one because do people choose to be lonely? That's a, a very hyper specific question, I think, too. And it, uh, you do you don't choose the infrastructures around you that uh, um, create loneliness or create the need for different kinds of relationships with humans and non humans. So, and and you don't choose to um, 
you don't choose the the history that you are placed in and the place where you are. It's a but there's something interesting about respect and trust and potentiality and possibility and reframing your thinking that that reframing of that thinking there is some a sense of agency there that we might have and maybe that's me like putting my foot in my mouth so i'm gonna go to the chat <laughs> and see if anyone has any um questions about uh loneliness and non-human kinship and how this conversation is kind of evolving and is um this intersection of these two worlds there are a few we had this question from um from nigel rothfels about uh, the recognition of the uncanny and uh, um feels like our recognition of the uncanny relation can resonate across the entire spectrum of the organic and the inorganic world. Um, but maybe that is that too is an anthropocentric perspective. Um, so we can continue to talk about the uncanny or um, Chris Kevorkian has put a question in the chat here. Is it possible to ask the panelists their thoughts on the most recently passed law in Idaho on personhood? Um, adds to the existing law to provide that environmental elements, artificial intelligence, non-human animals, and inanimate objects shall not be granted personhood. Um, and then there's a very specific uh, question to, to Juno um, uh, that uh, links to that question. So does any, do any of the panelists want to talk about personhood in this particular um, context and framework um, or talk to the uncanny or ask other questions of themselves. I open that up to you. I'll just add, I'll just say quickly that this law is the exact, is what, when I, when I say the word choice, I mean human choice to be uh, genocidal maniacs. Like it's a choice, you are on, what ontologies we choose are a choice, not listening to non-humans is a choice. Putting laws and, and, and lawmakers in place that do this is a choice. Choosing to recognize state power is a choice. It's all a choice. I'm choosing to use the computer, even though I know that it's like evil made, like <laughs> evil made a uh, physical, um, you know, but the, I think that choice is, um, uh, if, I, if, if I can afford it to non-humans, I can also choose to afford my own agency to myself and my decision-making. So um, it's also a choice that I don't go on a maniacal rage and, hurt some of these lawmakers. Yeah, to me, it seems like this law is in particular in response to new environmental movements to recognize non-human personhood. You know, the irony, of course, is the way personhood is extended to all sorts of non-human uh, from the right wing. So corporations get to be persons on <laughs> like fetuses who are like a single cell is considered a person in some places, or perhaps not in the law yet, but it's kind of the line of thought that they're going with with a heartbeat bill when it's we're talking about a collection of cells that happen to be connected to um, an artery or to like a circulatory system, you know. So it's um, clearly it's just they're using the language that's available to them for political ends, you know, which is what's to be expected in, in uh, this, um, in the context of politics that we're operating in, you know, and of course there's like from the right, they're so well organized with the um, banning of the word and any kind of idea of um, gayness, you know, and that it ties with conversations about race that are not allowed to happen. And it's against this idea of the innocence of wanting children to be innocent of racism, <laughs> innocent of heterosex or not even heterosexism, like innocent of understanding anything about uh, sexuality in the ways in which lives are organized around sexual variation. Like they don't want kids to be affirmed for their sexual diversity, you know, and that this is the use of politics in a way that is purposely um, purposely responding to social movements in both cases, like, or in those three different cases around race, around sexuality, and around environmentalism. And I know I'm saying this in a controversial state, <laughs> which is like, 
so we'll see. <laughs> we open up this conversation in its multitudes. Um, Barbara, Sonia, did you have anything to add to the personhood or um, going back around to a conversation between the, the five of us? This conversation makes me think about the um, sort of the, the the laws or activisms for passing laws on granting um, certain robot citizenship. It happened in multiple places. I think in Dubai and in Japan. Um, not not just not just limited to physical like physically physical robots, but also to you know digital um, characters and so on. Um, and I guess I will speak about this in a slightly maybe perhaps critical tone that um, I was that there is this interview with one of the leading social roboticists out there who makes realistic humanoids um, and when he was asked the question what do you think about these controversies about granting citizenship to robots he says well it's understandable that some people do not think it possible because now the robots we are having are so clumsy but when the technicalities are mature enough people will change their attitudes because they are going to equate robots with humans in a similar enough sense um, and i guess i mean putting technological determinism aside there is also this real danger in sort of for 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 these kinds of developments to reinforce that very specific notion of humanness that sort of further sort of distances us from these commitments or, or choices to attribute personhood or, or you know, to, to, to define personhood in different ways that um, you were all so eloquently talking about. So I guess that's a, like a slightly dark movement that I thought is worth mentioning. I don't really have any brilliant thoughts about personhood. I think that it's useful to kind of bring all the tools in the toolbox that we can to kind of explode these categories that we are always, you know, erecting firewalls and barriers, certainly in terms of categories of who is still considered, you know, fully human. I mean, we haven't solved that problem yet. Um, I was struck by what Suzanne was talking about with choice, and this would be taking things in a different direction. So we don't have to do that, but the infinite possibilities of the future. And yet, when we hear about this language in this bill in, in Idaho and what Juno was just talking about, it's how do we really exercise our personal choice with power when the communities around us and the power streams around us are, are pushing back. And so again, in a certain way, it brings us yet again to connection and specificity. And just to take a very um, hyperlocal example, you can't get more hyperlocal. My husband came down with a breakthrough infection of COVID after two years of avoiding this last week. And this happened because we attended a, a family event in which most people felt that it was no longer important to mask. And we stayed for one hour masked and left. And and we can insist as much as we want that we think masks are still important, but when we go into the community and we're faced with all of these other choices, that personal choice in a certain sense is brave but swamped. So does this not engender a certain loneliness, really? If you are attempting to exercise personal choice in a community in which those values are not shared, nor enacted, nor practiced. And I have been thinking about that a lot as a different type of loneliness. And certainly I think about it in terms of the extremely terrible pressure being brought against transgender, queer, and non-binary youth, um, which you know my, my child, um, an adult is non-binary and a gender. So we also experience this in a hyper-local way. So how do we take our personal choices and values and really interact in a community with all these pressures without feeling so much loneliness that it feels hard to continue? It's, um, it's a big question. 
And I, I think is related to a lot of the other conversations we were having at the previous mm-hmm. round table about how loneliness becomes defined and how values and seeking connection through shared values is one of these mm-hmm. aspects um, through which the, this, this manifests. Um, I, I, I'm seeing a lot of uh, chatter in the chat and I'm just gonna encourage everyone who's, who's here in the Zoom room to feel free to um, ask questions in, in the chat to our, um, to our panelists here. We have um, just about 15 more minutes and then uh, we will be ending the session. Um, are there any other uh, thoughts between uh, the five of us here about loneliness and connection? I think that speaking to hyperspecificity has been really, really interesting. Um, and thinking about ethical um, relationships and what they can look like. And also like the, the relationships between the non-human animal and the non-human robots or the, the computer screen that we're here, <laughs> we're trying to connect through this Zoom. And I feel disconnected in, in, in the distance between all of us. So um, I just kind of leave that open uh, if anyone has anything to add. I just wanted to say I I I really love the way that we are sort of deconstructing loneliness like step by step. Um, I was when when Barbara was talking about sort of the loneliness of having to make a choice that 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 you actually feel feel pressured from um, in the community. It reminds me of some of the um, social scientist formulations of loneliness in the twentieth century. For example, Hannah Arendt talking about loneliness as the like as one of the major conditions for totalitarianism when people are completely um, abandoned. I mean, fe- feeling completely deserted and taken away the ability to sort of make choices and make moral commitments to other people. Whereas um, there are also theorists such as. Um, um, Reisman, um, I think, I think last that in the last panel there was mentionings of Robert Putman, who talks about loneliness as a sort of necessary consequence for the um, of the freedom that is brought through in modernity. So there is this like tension between loneliness as a as a, as an as the consequence of an absence of choice and with the sort of over overblown of like over uh, explo- explosion of choice, I guess. Um, and then thinking about the idea of choice in the context of non-humans, I think it just makes me realize how human-centric all these formulations have been. It's so hard to like attach a specific qualifier to them when you are thinking about the spectrums of choices that we have as different species and types of beings. Um, I don't think I responded to anything that Nicole was, was, was posing, but this, these are just thoughts off my head. Yeah, I do think it's really interesting that our conversation about like loneliness, non-human kinship explodes into thinking about like, uh, like trans youth, <laughs> you know, and, you know, because it's like deeply personal for many of us, you know, like, what is the fight? Um, uh, but then I'm like trying to think through, okay, what is it about non-human animals that can really add to this conversation? of of loneliness you know knowing that human loneliness can be really profound like it, it's the reason for suicide for so many youth like particularly queer youth trans youth and it's also the reason for mass violence the explained reason for violence when you think about like the lone shooter who is described as being lonesome and lonely um and so there's like a lot of um pathology attached to human loneliness um, but okay, what happens when we think about loneliness with animals? Like my feeling is that we shouldn't think about it so pathologically, you know, that we should recognize, okay, there's like a range. It's a, just as there is great diversity on this planet with non-human variations, we should also think about sociality as having a lot of great variations too. And I think about like my dogs who are pictured over here <laughs> you know like um they're highly medicated <laughs> because they were adopted during covid and they're not used to social interaction and so then meeting people for them is an imposition you know like like we shouldn't always assume that people want your presence <laughs> you know <laughs> like in the same way that like we shouldn't like i know it's like the democratic argument is to say like these places should be accessible, but maybe there's some places where 
they just don't want to be messed with with people you know um so yeah i'll leave it at that yeah you know you know i was thinking when you were talking about how at the height of the pandemic a lot of zoos put out these pictures of animals sort of taking walks for recreation around the grounds like okay the penguins are going to go look at the tigers and then the zoo officials would be saying these animals miss the visitors they miss you they want you back and i'm thinking what you know, it may in fact be that these are the happiest, if you will, um, months of these zoo animals' lives. I mean, they're confined and they're constantly coping with human gaze and human shouting and human visitors. And this whole narrative that gets constructed about these lonely zoo animals is just, you know, I think um, very interesting. W where does that come from? What are they, are they trying to market, you know, the zoo experience? And is that really reciprocal? Do zoo animals get the same thing out of that? So I just wanna say that I'm convinced that a number of animal species and individuals are clearly capable of experiencing trauma, mental illness and trauma. I think we have actually very, very strong data to show this. And that I sometimes think that forcing them to interact with humans is exactly the wrong thing to do. And it's going to be on a case by case basis as it would be with humans. We do have a few questions in the chat uh, to, to circle back to. Um, uh, Director Ann Basting was just making a comment, kind of going back to, to Juno's point earlier about solitary confinement, where some people have no exposure, not only to other humans, but not to light, to nature, outside air, animals, and the concept of solitary confinement among animals. There is some hesitation there, and I think has to do with how we're thinking about trauma and violence and recognizing that the magnitude of trauma as it's reflected on, on certain people and certain animals, it's different. And that needs to be recognized and held in a special place to, to be just and ethical. So we can respond to that. And, and then Nigel and Leila, um, Leia have a, um, connected, but any any comments on that before we move forward? Can I just yeah. ask why do we assume it's different? Um, yeah, I actually um, have some thoughts on this. I, I think about this bear that I was, I, I was an intern uh, zookeeper for a summer. And the thing is with any bear, including sun bears that I am more familiar with um, because they're from Borneo, uh, once they have a history of confinement, they exhibit this kind of behavior called stereotypy, where they like walk around in a tiny, tiny circle, even though they may have a lot of access to a larger space. It's that impact of having um, been confined that they have this behavior where um, it looks sad when you see it because they're walking in such a tight circle. You know, um, that said, and so, part of the reason why it's kind of unethical to house bears in the zoos is because of this kind of behavior. However, that said, I think it's also important to recognize that some animals may not have the same extent of memory that we do. Um, so the example that was used that I came across was around uh, histories of sexual violence and forced copulation that happens with orangutans and as well as gorillas. And the thing is, like, what I write about is like the experience of seeing a near incident of that. Like, the viewer, like, how the viewer interprets it really depends on their perspective. So, like, I, along with other women who are watching it, were really super freaked out. Whereas the man who was there is like making jokes about this, you know? And um, the thing is, I, I talked with a primatologist about this who specializes in um, gorilla behavior. And she had the same exact experience. Like when women see this like incident of forced copulation, which is a typical behavior, it like freaks them out, you know, and that the men think it's funny or something, or um, they don't ex experience the same gravity of the situation. But the thing is that what she was saying, even as she is a feminist, she's saying that the, like what we actually know of what gorillas remember and what they recognize as trauma, we don't actually know, you know, because our ability to access that is so much predicated on human language 
and I sameness, you know, but then how about this like profound difference? You know, like when you think about the millions of years of evolutionary time that divide you and like a gorilla or an orangutan, it's really impossible to know like what that same experience was, um, you know, uh, that the interpretation, the experience is fundamentally different and we don't have access to it. And that's the problem. However, the only access we do have are in behaviors that happen that we can then record. So that's why I feel comfortable saying, I don't think it's a good idea to put a bear in captivity because their activity then of like walking very tightly in a circle is very troubling. Can I say something back? Yeah. This is fascinating. And I really like the fact that we have divergent perspectives because that's what makes it interesting. We know that elephants who have observed their family members being poached have nightmares. We know that rats who watch other rats essentially um, getting electric shocks or having other horrible things happen to them respond in a way that is clearly showing their distress. And we also know that they dream in ways that are very clearly nightmarish. I mean, they wake up in ways that just tell you um, that they're having a terrible sleep experience. And it is possible now for sleep researchers to actually compare what rats sort of do during the day to the motor patterns at night to know a little bit about what they're dreaming about in really fascinating ways. So I would say that do we need to know exactly whether an animal is having the identical experience to us to recognize that they're capable of trauma? And so solitary confinement is not going to mean the same thing to one animal or another animal, including a human. But I think that this compels us to think about social justice very, very strongly because we know how profoundly these animals feel. I don't think that's as much in question. Well, I think for me, the question is the knowing part, you know, cause I recognize with elephants that, you know, they visit the bones of their uh, deceased um, pack members. You know, they're like, they put their snouts on the ivory, um, you know, on the, the tusks of, um, the carcass of an an of other elephants that they knew. And so recognizing that the practice is to actually cut out that tusk denies the elephant the ability to do the practices that the elephant wants to do, because that's the practice that uh, conservationists do in Tanzania and uh, other places where they have to remove the tusks so that it doesn't encourage poachers, right? But by doing so, it denies the elephant the ability to do those um, sets of behaviors that we think of as, as grief. But like the point remains that what we think we know is based on some kind of evidence. So like some kind of like detection of motor um, responses from the rat. And that's how you're saying, I know that the rat is dreaming. You know, like we don't know the content of those dreams. We just know that they're like in REM sleep, you know, and that they're moving their bodies, you know, so that there's, it requires some leaps, you know, like, and I think about like the example and cultural anthropology of like how dogs dream, you know, like, okay, we know dogs dream, but like, what is the content of that dream? Like for Runa people, it's like hunting, you know, and it's like, it's like totally different kinds of dreams. So um, I think it's, I, I think we still in either case requires specificity. And we also require some sets of evidence, right? Like our grounding for our argument is made on some kind of evidence, but that evidence lends itself to thinking very specifically of these particular animals and their particular needs. And, and using very specific, um, that evidence is tied to the context of the researcher and that evidence and how, how much we wanna make that leap to make that connection. and. I think that that ties into this other question that Nigel and Leah were talking about in the chat. This is an important conversation. And I think one that talks about hierarchies of like, it, are we establishing hierarchies of knowing how might we like be slipping into that and how do we like combat that in ethical ways? And it might have to do with this disconnect and connection, the connecting to these evidence to a claim, connecting to each other, connecting to, to the land. Um, 
Nigel made this note, I'm thinking about Kite's point about the settlers search for indigeneity as partly a quest to overcome loneliness and all these amazing thoughts about loneliness and violence. And to Nigel's point, Leia saying and asking, what is the difference or connection between loneliness and disconnectedness? Are they the same? Because I think that there's something here um, that's related to no ability and connection and also disconnection and unknowing and the manifestation of these various like passionate argu like arguments that people that we are all in the middle of when it comes to advocating for both humans and non-humans. So I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that. Yeah, I'll just say this one example, because again, as we said, I think a few different times in different ways, like we're trapped by the English language right now in this conversation. Um, but even, and then that's what I mean by the hyperlocal, like um, all be all objects, beings, beinghoods exist in specific places in specific contexts, and and language does that too. And I mean, there's of course the question of if you know is language what makes? I think that's what's interesting about AI to me is this um, like the putting intelligence on a pedestal, human intelligence on it, like, like somehow intelligence is somehow good or helpful or um, beneficial. I don't think at this point I can, I agree with that. Um, and, but the thing is, that's only in what, that's a specific Western concept, like knowing being a good thing versus unknowing facts, being good or helpful, being actually a good, like good thing, like not always. Um, and the and I and I guess I see that the same with with the with language and in like in Lakota language you can't even you 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 don't say like I am I am lonely like I don't think I I'm not an, a linguist a Lakota linguist but when you say lonely you're lo you're lonesome for something like that is how you can use the word as far as I understand and it's about sorrow um, you you are lonesome for something you're not just lonely um but would love a lakota linguist to jump in and correct me if i'm wrong but but you hear it a lot in translations and in song um so of course when i you know when you say that these um i do think that wherever you are people are lonesome for the for connection humans are are, are lonesome for the the land I'm noticing that we are at time. Um, we're not able to get to all of the the um, comments in the chat, but um, just like anyone, have a last thing to say about loneliness and non-human kinship before we end. There's a lot to think about, and this was a absolutely lovely conversation. Um, thank you so much to all of you for being part of this, to the um, various different uh, visitors to the Zoom room to catch some of the conversation that we were having. Um, just a reminder to everyone that this will be recorded and available online. Really hoping I can splice together some of the pieces that we had in the beginning and end due to the um, unfortunate Zoom crash on my end. But we welcome you to, to dive in deeper um, listen to the six and a half minute podcast with uh, with both Barbara and Sonia to learn a little bit more about their work and research. Check out the interactive book club where we have links to Suzanne Kite's artwork as well as to um, Juno's publications. And be sure to catch our um, third um, roundtable conversation, which will focus on incarceration and solitary confinement, as well as um, ways that art music and, um, and, and plays and theater um, can help uh, with this alleviation of this transition uh, between loneliness and connection. Um, so thank you all again with that. Uh, Randolph, if you could stop the recording, uh, that's the end of our session.